the cyber dimensions of violent extremism in Africa. My name is Nate Allen. I am Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center and the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues. This webinar is the third in a series of quarterly webinars we are hosting to understand how information technology is influencing the African continent's security threats and challenges. Before we continue with the substance of today's program, I'd like to briefly turn things over to the director of the Africa Center, Kate Omquist Kanath, to say a few words. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Nate, and uh, good day uh, to all of our colleagues. Welcome to the Africa Center's alumni, uh, our many distinguished colleagues, and uh, of course, uh, so many friends uh, who are joining us uh, for this program today. Now, as many of you know, the Africa Center serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security uh, trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing these serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging together, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, national, regional, and international partners, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. So this kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you once again for joining uh, with us in this endeavor today. You know, we look forward to this conversation on cyber dimensions uh, of terrorism and uh, a warm welcome and uh, uh, thank you to our panelists uh, for bringing their, us their expertise. Nate, back to you. Thank you very much, Kate. Now on to introduce the, the webinar. This is the third in a four part series. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our, our first webinar in December gave a broad overview of the African continent cybersecurity challenges while our webinar in March discussed how ICT and other emerging technologies are influencing the threats from state-based actors. In this webinar, we will turn to our attention to non-state actors, and in particular, the linkages between cyberspace, emerging technology, and violent extremism. This is a crucially important topic given the chronic and rising violent extremist threats in Africa. But I think it is also a topic that is both underexplored in some ways and misunderstood in others. We have three main objectives today to help us more deeply understand this issue. First, we wanna expand understanding of how the spread of digital technology is influencing violent extremist groups in Africa. And while there have been lots of analysis and efforts to, for example, reduce online recruit recruitment into violent extremist organizations, I think what we are going to find is that there are other very important dimensions of this relationship. Second, we want to explore how specific emerging technologies like cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, drones, and remote weapons are influencing the strategies and tactics of violent extremist groups, or may begin to do so in the future as some of these technologies become more widely adopted. Finally, we hope to discuss what to do about it. Uh, the local, national, and international authorities always seem to be two steps behind the latest developments in emerging technology. It's important at least to try to strive to remain a step or two ahead. And particularly in the digital age, I would say it's crucial that we meet these threats in ways that are consistent with citizen security and with the rule of law, two values that I know are very crucial to both the Africa Center and its alumni. So to help us illuminate, unpack these issues, we have assembled an all-star group of scholars. Um, uh, you have their biographies, so I will keep their introductions brief, but we're delighted to have all three of them 
uh, with us today. First, we have Dr. Audrey Kurth Cronin, who is professor at American University's School of International Service and founding director of the Center for Security into Innovation and New Technology. Her career has spanned both academia and government service, in addition to holding academic positions at Oxford and National Defense University's own National War College here in DC. She has also held positions with the United States Congressional Research Service and with the Office of the Secretary of Defense. She is also the author of this recent book, uh, Power to the People, How Open Technological Innovation is Arming Tomorrow's Terrorists, which analyzes the risks and opportunities in the use of emerging technologies by non-state actors. We'll discuss some of the book's findings in a moment, but I'll just say it's, it's one of the most insightful reads uh, on emerging tech and violent extremism. Generally, I, I commend it to, to our audience. It's a great book. Um, next, we have with us the Africa Center's own Dr. Anwar Bukars. He, as many of you know, is professor of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism here at the Africa Center. He leads the Africa Center's efforts to work with security sector leaders to develop and implement activities to address the extremist threat in Africa. Prior to joining the Africa Center, Dr. Bukars was a non-resident fellow in the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and an associate professor of international relations at McDaniel College. Delighted to have you as a panelist and really looking forward to your always very revealing uh, insights. And finally, we have with us Dr. Christopher Anselm. He is a research assistant professor at Marine Corps University, an affiliate scholar with the, Central, with the Center for Global Islamic Studies at George Mason University. His research focuses on political Islam and Muslim political movements, including militant Islamist organizations, religion and sectarianism, Shiite Islam, and political violence and civil wars. He is a particularly keen observer and has written widely about Al-Shabaab and its uses of emerging technology. So we're delighted to hear that perspective. Um, so welcome. The way that we are going to structure this panel is that we're gonna begin with Audrey, who will discuss the relationship between technological innovation and violent extremism globally. Then we're gonna to go to Anwar, who will consider broadly what we know about how extremists are leveraging emerging technology in Africa. And then we're going to go to Christopher, who will specifically discuss how emerging technology has influenced Al-Shabaab. So, Andre, we're going to begin with you. One of the things I really enjoyed about reading your book was it offers a very sweeping historical perspective. There are so many studies that look at the relationship between violent extremism on one particular technology, using one outcome, analyzing one group, over the course of a singular conflict or even a singular instant. This book, by, by contrast, analyzes the relationship between technological innovation and political violence by non-state actors over the past 150 years plus. So I want you to unpack this relationship for us. My question to you is, how have non-state actors historically taken advantage of emerging technology? And how is our current period, as you call it, of open technological revolution and the maturing of the digital age, influencing the strategies, operations, and tactics of modern violent extremists or insurgent groups. Andre. Thank you so much for the generous introduction and also for the kind words about my book. We are going to start very big, uh, looking at broad trends in technology and then get down much more gradually to uh, the, their relevance for today. Because my feeling is that we can't understand what we're facing today unless we think about patterns of innovation. So I'll start out by talking about a contrast between open and closed technological innovation. A closed technological revolution, a period of closed technological innovation was what we had in the 20th century. So military and scientific elites could limit access to major weapon systems, things like nuclear weapons, uh, satellites, jet fighters, even radar early on. These things were very expensive, rare, difficult to build, and they were protected by things like security classifications or copyrights. But in about 1993, the United States shifted very consciously to open development of digital technologies. And today's technological changes 
are driven by research that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but then was shared in the 1990s. And so things like ARPANET becoming the internet and the GPS system becoming uh, globally available, that was developed by US tax dollars and used to be a proprietary. And virtually all of the major components of the smartphone came from US government funded programs, things like microchips, touch screens, even voice activated systems like Siri and uh, Alexa. So the point is that here we are 30 years later and we're in the middle of an open technological revolution where there's popular access to advanced lethal techno technologies and they spread via commercial processes and they're, they're designed specifically to help people experiment. So a much wider range of people can access them and that's causing societal change as well as change in how we fight, how, how we have conflict. The last time we had this kind of open technological setting was in the late 19th century when modern terrorism began. Like today, there were changes in global patterns of innovation, trade and communications. And just like today, there was a kind of giddy techno optimism and there was no clear dividing line between amateur and scientific professional communities. And people were free to purchase, uh, you know, wiring kits, high explosives, chemicals and so on and tinker with them in the same way that today people can purchase drones or build robots or build primitive gene splicing, uh, use primitive gene splicing kits. So tinkerers and hobbyists in the late 19th century made a remarkable range of new inventions. Uh, for example, it, it, the Italian electrician, Guimo Marconi invented the radio in the late 1890s and he was just working in the attic of his home. Orville and Wilbur Wright, you will remember uh, their role in creating the aircraft. They made the first sustained powered and controlled flight in 1903. And they had been working in their bicycle shop back at home in Dayton, Ohio. And Alfred Nobel first tinkered with explosives in the shed in the backyard of his home. And he came up with dynamite. And that dynamite was wonderful for building the industrial, the industrial world. It built mines tunnels, bridges, the Panama Canal, but it also launched the first global wave of terrorism. So if it hadn't been for the invention of dynamite, that accessible, easy to use type of explosive, modern terrorism might not have happened, at least not in the way that it did. And it set off, dynamite set off the first global wave of political violence in the late 19th century, which was known as the anarchist wave. And the global spread of terrorism was remarkable. Between 1867 and 1934, dynamitings killed people on every continent except Antarctica. So for example, in Africa, uh, African dynamite attacks happened in South Africa and the Transvaal. And you also had dynamite attacks in North Africa, in uh, especially Algeria and Tunisia. But the other key historical invention that had a huge role in political violence was the Kalashnikov assault rifle. Pressures for decolonization were very deep and long-standing, but after 1945, political independence mo movements were fueled, at least in part, by the Avtomat Kalashnikova 1947, or the AK-47. So Mikhail Kalashnikov was a very short guy, and he was a tank operator. Um, he was really well suited for being on the inside of the tank, but in 1941, he was badly injured in a battle in the Battle of Bryansk. He was uh, injured by the Nazis. And so according to Soviet legend, from his hospital bed, Kalashnikov decided to build a better defensive weapon to protect the Russian homeland. And the result was the AK-47. Of course, the genius of the gun was its simplicity. It was designed for illiterate peasants who were conscripted into the Red Army. It was easy to carry, shorter than most infantry rifles at the time. It weighed only 10 pounds and its parts were interchangeable gun to gun. It also rattled, was inaccurate, shorter range than most competitors. And it was the butt of ridicule by American and British firearms experts who had made much more elegant and difficult to handle weapons and were very proud of those. But the AK-47 truly changed the world. Of course, revolutionaries and terrorists had used firearms long before that. But those were expensive and difficult to maintain and much more effective in the hands of well-trained professional soldiers. But the AK-47 changed the equation and it became the most widely dispersed firearm in history, outstripping the uh, American M16 by five or 10 times. 
Anyway, tens of millions were manufactured and promoted and distributed by the Soviet government, which kind of used it as a as a currency almost. There were uh, AK-47 and Kalashnikov factories that proliferated throughout the world. So the AK-47 was unusual in the 20th century. It was an open technological platform in the midst of a closed period of innovation. But like dynamite, the rifle developed a symbolic resonance that helped it spread through global communications, including through magazines and television. Anyway, the rate of insurgencies after 1945, after about the time that the AK-47 was invented, greatly increased. So just to sum up, emerging technology has always been critical to political violence and to those global patterns. Key watersheds have resulted from a shift in who can access weapons and who can tinker with them and then show up to fight, not just from which side has the most technologically advanced new means. And right now we're in another era of open technological innovation where new and emerging technologies are being driven by commercial forces, where we have huge changes in our communications, and these technologies are easy to use, cheap, transportable, simple to tinker with, and much more accessible than ever before. And that will change patterns of global political violence, and it already has as we go forward. Thank you very much, Audrey. I, I particularly like how you characterize this current period we're living in as an open technological revolution driven by the increasing availability of new and potentially lethal technology. And then if you look historically, that is what has seemed to have affected the patterns of non-state violence. It's this open revolution of new and lethal technology, not necessarily technologically innovation in and of itself. And in fact, that that you know, the closed revolution, the nuclear revolution has been pretty much the dominant metaphor for which we've analyzed emerging technologies to date. So I think it's a really big contribution, this concept of, of open technological revolution. I'd like you to drill down a little bit more. You just started to, to help us understand and unpack what some of these technologies are that are so lethal and so accessible and might have the possibility of impacting and are impacting lethal non-state violent in our non-state violent in, violence in our current age. In the book in particular, you argue that there are sort of three key technological trends, mobilization, power projection, and systems integration that are changing who and how destructive force is being employed in our societies. And so my question is, what are some of the key technologies driving these three trends? And what is their impact likely to be on organized violence committed by extremist groups? Sure, well, thanks, Nate. That brings us to the current day. And so we have to think not just about innovation, but diffusion, meaning the spread of the technologies. And the first big uh, thing that is happening is mobilization. And this is the thing that everybody focuses on. Nate was talking earlier about how we worry about radicalization. This is part of this mobilization trend. It's not unusual to use me new means of communication to recruit or train people to terrorism. But in the, 19th, so in the 19th century, the anarchists used pamphlets and uh, manuals that taught people how to use dynamite, for example. But what's really different today is the scale and the scope. Everyone has a powerful computer in their pockets and there's mass interactivity, robotic replication of messages, live streaming of attacks, high quality first person filmmaking that can make anyone a television producer. Al-Shabaab was the first jihadi group to live tweet an oper operation as we're going to hear about perhaps in a few minutes. But radicalization is also easier and faster. It used to take people at least 18 months to be radicalized, but now it's taking a matter of weeks, for example, in the United States with QAnon. And there's greater potential to be individually recruited and groomed. Algorithms help people discover other groups with which they have something in common, and then they can get onto private uh, websites and chats like Reddit or Parler or CloudHub, all of those private uh, chat rooms. And, and these, so the Islamic State's use of strategic communication was one of the most important things that it did. They used it to recruit and attract resources, to justify and legitimize their violence, and to intimidate the civilian population. And one thing that was interesting about them is that they used the Call of Duty game uh, to as, as sort of their motif, and that's been copied by other groups like HDS in Syria. Plus, in addition to mobilization though, 
proxy armies and terrorists have a means to carry out attacks at much greater distances. And that's the second big trend. And that's open innovation of reach or power projection. So the first one was mobilization. Power projection is the second big trend. And that's been developing for a while. People are combining clusters of technologies to create something new. So for example, small UAVs or drones, robots, 3D printing, and simple autonomy combined to offer this greater reach and power projection to a wider range of actors. The Islamic State first used fixed wings, small drones and quadcopters for propaganda, reconnaissance, attack management, and delivering small payloads that uh, intimidated the civilian population. In 2017, Ukrainian separatists used small drones to drop thermite grenades on ammunition depots. We're seeing simple drones being used by the Taliban in Afghanistan. So for example, just this last November, um, some uh, a member of the Taliban used a weaponized DJI Matrix quadcopter, a, a 210 quadcopter, to attack the governor's compound in Kunduz. And his bodyguards were just outside playing volleyball. And then this, this uh, explosive came down on their heads and he, they were, a number of them were killed. Simple systems can have huge impact. Counter drone technology is very expensive. Most systems are $100,000 or more to protect against these simple quadcopters. And in very large areas, it can cost multiple millions of dollars. Many can't afford that. Plus little drones are very hard to shoot down. And they're difficult to spot. A UAV was used as reconnaissance over the mosque before the bloody Christchurch, New Zealand attack, for example. And the American neo-Nazi group Atomwaffen has used UAVs for propaganda. More serious military UAVs are getting cheap too. And they're cheap enough that non-state actors and proxy armies are, are more able to afford them as we've seen with the Houthis in Yemen. So basically drones are like a poor person's air force. Another aspect of reach is facial recognition technology that can be used to target individuals for killing. And then there's additive manufacturing or 3D printing. This is actually a very old technology, but it's becoming much more widely available because people use encrypted pla platforms like Keybase in order to print things. Most recently, there's been a new um, ability to print assault rifles that actually function via uh, sharing of those blueprints. This is potentially a very dangerous development. And we're very much more vulnerable targets too. So remember that with all the world saturated by cyber physical systems in the internet of things, um, there are sensors that are directly connected to the internet and that's hugely increased the attack surface, the ability to reach people through the internet. Uh, and we've seen this recently in the United States with the colonial pipeline being attacked and held in ransomware. Anyway, so how do we handle all that data and all that technology? The third big trend is systems integration. And we're really just at the beginning of this trend, but our systems are becoming so fast, complex, data rich and advanced that human intelligence can't manage them all. And so the answer is to build in degrees of autonomy. So that means that the machine can act uh, without direct human involvement. So simple forms of autonomy are becoming much cheaper uh, a number of different jihadist groups have shown interest in autonomous systems. And every time in an open technological environment, a major state like the United States, China, Russia uses a new system, it becomes a demonstration effect, especially if there are cheaper ver versions that can be used in political violence. So anyway, to sum up, it used to require an army, a professional state army to do all three of these things to mobilize, to have power projection, and then also to have systems integration. But what we're seeing is that now individuals or small groups and proxy armies, uh, including individuals like terrorists or terrorist groups, they can do all three. Well, thank you so much, Audrey. I think you've given an absolutely masterful overview of how emerging technology has both influenced non-state violence historically and how mobilization, uh, power projection, and systems integration really have the potential to, to be revolutionary today. Anwar, I'd like to turn the conversation to you, and I'd like you to begin to break down for us what some of what we heard might look like, might be looking like in an African context. 
And I'd like to start by reviewing what we know specifically about the link between digital technology, information and communications technology, and violent extremism. So Anwar, how in your view has ICT influenced things like recruitment, financing, the organization, and tactics of violent extremist groups in Africa? And are you worried about, for example, the, the prospect of a cyber attack from an African extremist group, something we've heard warned about for a while, we know some instances of, or there are other dimensions, other ways in which extremist groups use digital technology that you maybe find a little bit more concerning. Anwar, over to you. Um, th thanks, Nate. I mean, the, you know, this topic of how uh, violent extremist groups are using, you know, information and communications and other uh, emergent technologies is, in the African context, is still an underexplored one. I mean, when you look at the current scholarship, it still lacks a, a um, systematic assessment of the impact that you know, information communication technologies have on African uh, violent extremist organization, on their tactics and, <clears throat> and their strategies. And the few studies that exist, I mean, they tend to be based, uh, as you yourself noted in one of your writings, on limited evidence. Uh, and they tend to ascribe, to ascribe a significant degree of, of success to these, to these groups. Uh, to to the way they have exploited cyberspace. That's why it's 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 critical to note that there are differences, obviously, between <clears throat> VA violent extremist groups, how they have exploited cyberspace in Africa, in comparison with how other groups uh, have done in, say, Europe or the United States or the Middle East, uh, for that matter. Because despite the rapid growth in internet penetration, you know, only a quarter. Uh, of Africa has, has internet access today, even if cell phone coverage obviously is, is higher. And most violence by violent extremist groups, as again, <clears throat> you pointed out, Nate, in one of your writings, you know, takes place in these, uh, in the hinterland, these peripheral rural areas where internet and, and cellular uh, penetration is, is, is not strong. That said, the general literature, you know, identifies about five to six uh, sometimes overlapping categories in how you classify uh, the means by which these new technologies are often utilized to promote <clears throat> and support acts of violent extremism in the continent. And the obvious one is, is propaganda. And that includes, you know, recruitment, uh, incitement to terrorism. Uh, then there's financing, training, planning, including through secret communication and open source information execution, <clears throat> and to a lesser extent in the African context, cyber attacks. So in the case of Africa, there is a general agreement that you know, violent extremist groups, such as Boko Haram, such as Jamaat, uh, uh, Musab al-Islam al-Muslimin, G-N-I-N, Shabaab, you know, they have used or they use mobile technology, even web-enabled media as a source of propaganda. And propaganda generally takes the form of you know, these multi-media uh, communications that provide, you know, ideological instruction or practical instruction, uh, you know, justifications or the promotion of, of, of violent activities. And this is done through virtual messages, you know, through magazines, through audio, through video files that are developed by these, uh, by these groups and their sympathizers. Uh, information communication technologies also allow violent extremist groups in the continent to control both the pace and the narrative of violence. So it gives them uh, uh, the ability to reach wider audiences. We have seen that with Ansar Dean <clears throat> in Mali. When Ansar Dean was kicked off, you know, uh, mainstream platforms such as YouTube, you know, Ansar Dean turned to Telegram, you know, this highly encrypted messaging service to reach out to regional audiences and to news media as well especially when they wanted, you know, their messages to reach <clears throat> uh, further afield. There's also some evidence to suggest that groups like, you know, Boko Haram uh, and GNIM, they have benefited from, <clears throat> you know, the internet, obviously, and from mobile technologies to gain recruits. So their propaganda is often, as you know, tailored to appeal to, you know, marginalized groups in society. And the process of recruitment capitalizes you know, on you know, individual sentiment of 
exclusion or of injustice or, 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 or humiliation. And as a UN report pointed out in that context, propaganda is also adapted to account for demographic factors. And it appeals to youth, it appeals to gender, as well as to social and economic circumstances. Uh, violent extremist groups in Africa also use the internet to finance you know, acts of, <clears throat> of terrorism, though the degree to which the internet is critical to this is contested. Uh, you know, there is evidence that both cyber crime and cyber enabled crime is a source of finance for Boko Haram. Though again, you know, how much is, as you yourself noted, is, is an open question. Uh, the internet can also <clears throat> function as an alternative, or it does function as an alternative training ground for these, these groups, you know, providing detailed instructions, often in accessible <clears throat> multimedia format on topics such as how to construct explosives, you know, firearms, or other weapons, how to plan and execute uh, <clears throat> terrorist attacks. And we know that Boko Haram has uh, used web-based and mobile communications to coordinate, you know, to plan, and to execute some attacks. Uh, Boko Haram members reportedly use cell phones and encrypted media such as Telegram to conduct clandestine business with one another. So it is believed that, that the group uses uh, information on the internet to construct improvised explosive devices right, and detonate them uh, using cell phone triggers. Uh, Boko Haram was the first African extremist group to use drones. And, and that brings me to your point about the prospect of <clears throat> violent extremist groups launching cyber attack in the near future. You know, that prospect is low, right? In the African context, we have seen that it happens elsewhere. Even if the possibility exists that a group like GNIM or Boko Haram, uh, you know, and others recruit members who could launch such an attack. So the possibility is, is there. And Boko Haram is suspected of launching an attack uh, <clears throat> of what you yourself described as cyber sabotage, the 2012, uh, when they leaked online details about the members of the Nigerian State Security Service. But overall, <clears throat> uh, uh, so far, launching a cyber attack still necessitates tackling practical challenges, such as poor you know, internet, uh, infrastructure, uh, the lack of, of, of resources. So uh, the possibility exists to answer your question, but it's still still very low. Over. Thank you very, very much, Anwar. And I, I agree with you that, that a major cyber attack by a violent extremist group in Africa is certainly a possibility, something we should prepare for, but also a comparatively minor aspect of the threat and I think as you've highlighted, there are so many other important and, and frankly, not well understood elements of the, of the ways in which ICT is influencing violent extremism in Africa, not just through recruitment, but through financing, through training, through operations. Those, those, those are, are really, really important. So I'd, I'd like to turn now our discussion from the effect of digital technology on violent extremism in Africa to related emerging technologies that Audrey discusses in her book, but are, are just beginning to become commercially available, just beginning to, 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 to diffuse. You mentioned drones a little bit. So, so how are emerging technologies like drones, like AI, like autonomous weapons, beginning to impact the strategies and tactics of violent extremist organizations in Africa? You mentioned how low internet penetration maybe limits the threat to some degree for now. So maybe, maybe also, what, what, what technologies are you potentially most concerned about in the future? We know that, that the continent is actually digitizing quite, quite rapidly. Um, so what, what, what emerging technologies are you most concerned about? How do you think they're likely to influence violent extremism in Africa? Sure, that's an excellent, excellent question. Again, in the African context, you know, there's still little that we know about how these emerging technologies, they impact <clears throat> the strategies and tactics of, of VA groups, violent extremist organizations in Africa. And <clears throat> there are some dis discussions that tend to paint, you know, a futuristic picture of the threat, uh, you know, uh, accepting scenarios of the weaponization of artificial intelligence and, and killer drones. So the question becomes is how probable are these scenarios in the African context? I mean, are they based on actual evidence? Is the threat assessment based on assumed <clears throat> technical capacities 
and, and hindered access to, <clears throat> to new technologies. And as one scholar cautioned, uh, you know, we need a more proportional discourse on the use of new and innovative technology in, in tourism in the African context, even if we should not, as, as Audrey brilliantly uh, outlined, close our eyes, right, <clears throat> uh, uh, for, for how these technologies can be used or for the unknown unknowns. Uh, you know, most terrorist attacks in Africa so far <clears throat> have been committed not by using new technologies, but by low techniques. So it's important, as, as, as one, one scholar put it at the International Center for Counterterrorism, <clears throat> to assess whether violent extremist groups in the African context, you know, actually need these means, you know, the killer drones, the artificial intelligence assassinations, for example, for the, these areas. Do these scenarios align with their needs? Do they align with their incentives? Do they align with their motivations? So that said, the assertion that violent extremist groups, you know, will use drones or, or uh, an artificial intelligence for their benefits, of course, it's possible. Uh, as, as, uh, as, as Van der Veer, a scholar at the ICST, put it, just as we all do, <clears throat> all of us, you know, we can assume that violent extremist groups, you know, probably benefit from machine learning too and other forms of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, in the preparations for their military operations, for the gathering of information. Uh, so these scenarios are possible and, and they seem to align with the motives and incentives of violent extremist groups in, <clears throat> in the continent. But the bottom line is that adopting a technology, <clears throat> especially new technology, is determined by capacity, <clears throat> by interest, <clears throat> sorry, and by context. So we have to analyze how, you know, violent extremist groups such as Boko Haram, or as we will hear in a few minutes, or Shabab, you know, can procure and, and field <clears throat> a given technology. And this is where we have, to, we have to examine the financial, the technical and infrastructural capacities of these groups. We have also to examine whether a group actually wants to invest in this innovation. <clears throat> and this, this is where we take up the question of, of motivation and the relative value of this new technology to a group such as Boko Haram or G and I am or, uh, or, uh, or ISIS affiliated groups. <clears throat> so the answer to your question about technologies I'm most concerned about, I would say probably drones at this stage. And the question becomes, you know, can violent extremist groups in the continent in Africa feel the drone programs? Do they want to? Does it matter for them? And we can assume that, that they do, right? And the first factor in assessing this possibility is the financial investment involved. So as, uh, as one scholar put it, Horowitz, the more expensive the endeavor, the fewer the actors that can afford it. So for example, military-grade drones are costly to build, are costly to operate, are costly to import, are costly to maintain. So that's not doable at this stage for these groups. Conversely, civilian drones are cheap, they are user-friendly, and that makes them, you know, feasible uh, for these groups. Uh, and in fact, today we are even seeing advanced uh, militaries that are beginning to deploy these civilian drones at the tactical level, at the platoon level. <clears throat> so, so as a result, violent extremist groups, you know, so far mostly outside Africa, very few exceptions in the continent, have used commercial and, and hobbyists for hobbyists, hobbyist drones for, you know, as you heard Audrey say, for propaganda, for intelligence surveillance, for reconnaissance, for command and control. And as occurred with the so-called Islamic State, weaponized attacks. Uh, in Libya, non-state actors, you know, reportedly used drones for surveillance. And, and, and outside the continent, you know, if you look at an example, even under you know, strict territorial constraints and military occupation, some Palestinian groups you know, have been successful in smuggling drones and component parts, and this is under military occupation. So the malleability of civilian drones is, is one of the key attractions for non-state actors, including violent extremist groups, because it allows for the multiple various and creative uses. And civilian drones, you know, are, are useful. Uh, and this is why we can, you know, predict that they will be 
<clears throat> you know, use, they are useful at the strategic level. They, are, they can be used for propaganda as the so-called Islamic State did, you know, in, in, in the Middle East, uh, as a weaponized attack. You know, violent extremist groups like ISIS demonstrated that they could accomplish this. And, and ISIS did that by being equipped, you know, entirely with hobbyist models. And it showed, you know, a successful drone program. The Houthi rebels, as Audrey said, you know, have used drones to strike a Saudi warship, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the examples, examples abound. Uh, so the, 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 the capacity is, is not there yet in the African continent, but, but we can safely, you know, uh, uh, assume that, uh, that, uh, that, it, that, that it's going to happen and, and, and very soon. So I'll stop right here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar. I, I, great overview. I, I totally agree that at least for the next five to 10 years, the technology to be most concerned about to watch most closely is, is drones, just due to how cheap they are, how rapidly they're diffusing, and indeed how some parts of Africa are ahead of the world in terms of their adoption of commercial drone technology, especially in, in East Africa. So that's a space I would watch uh, quite closely. Um, so now we're going to move on to Christopher, who is going to help us understand how the digital revolution has impacted Al-Shabaab. As I'm sure many of you are aware, Al-Shabaab is Africa's largest violent extremist group, uh, one of its most long-standing, and also perhaps its most sophisticated user of emerging technology. So I think it's both a great case study and also perhaps an example of a group that has achieved a level of organization, a technical sophistication that many other groups across, across the continent uh, might strive for. So my question, Chris, how has Al-Shabaab historically harnessed digital technology? And how would you say Al-Shabaab's use of digital technology, as, as Anwar highlighted for purposes like recruitment, financing, communications, or in combat, how has its use of digital technology contributed to its resilience and persistence as an insurgency? Sure, thank you um, to the Africa Center for, for having me. And um, first, just a very brief sort of overview of Al-Shabaab's, sort of the history of Al-Shabaab's use of different sort of emerging technologies, whether it be the internet or social media platforms. And then I wanna play off of some of the, or, or um, yeah, play off some of the things that Audrey and Anwar have, have talked about, about the sort of very new technologies. And also the question, the very important question is, what is it worth it to, in, for these, for Al-Shabaab specifically to invest in, for example, drones, you know, particularly weaponizing? Does it need to do that um, to, would it really enhance its capabilities at the, at the present moment to invest a lot of, particularly because this is, would be very costly potentially, is it worth it for them? So Al-Shabaab, as it emerged in 2007 as, as a sort of a fully independent group from the, the collapsing Islamic Courts Union, what it needed to do is it needed to establish a very sort of clear new identity for itself. And, and this is where its use of, for example, just sort of websites that it set up or that its supporters outside, for example, in Scandinavia, set up for it. Um, its participation in the various Al Qaeda affiliated sort of internet web forums. This enabled it to, to create a very clear sort of distinct new organizational identity. The early Al Shabaab materials from um, you know late 2006 the two, throughout 2007. You know they're not the, the footage is particularly not high quality. Um, it mimics almost directly sort of early Al Qaeda type films, sort of propaganda films. But as we get into a couple years down the road, 2009 in particular, particularly the end of 2009, we begin to see more sophisticated both narrative structures to their propaganda films as well as footage quality. And this then increases from year to year to, to the point now where it is, um, I mean, some of their propaganda pseudo, I call them pseudo documentary type uh, film productions would be almost unintelligible. You know, they look like a doc they look like any other documentary if you kind of ignore the a very propagandistic sort of messaging in terms of the quality of, of the investment in, in, in creating a narrative and creating a, a sort of very polished look. While acknowledging, I think, so the question of new technology versus older technologies, I think it's also important to for us to remember and to note that particularly for their domestic messaging purposes to domestic audiences, because Al-Shabaab, one, one of its key Character self identity characteristics is as a kind of a, a state or a proto state. This is how it likes to see itself, um, even if 
you know, compared to, to full states, it's very rudimentary. So that for its domestic messaging purposes, older forms of media continue to be very, very important and even central. So for example, radio broadcasts are very important to its domestic messaging, propaganda messaging, um, simple photography or sort of, you know, not, not high, you know, not um, only propaganda films. And then some of the, some of these films which are aimed um, primarily at external audiences, whether friendly or sort of their opponents are also have dual uses, meaning that they show them domestically as well. This is something that we saw with ISIS, something that we see with the Afghan Taliban for, uh, as well. Um, so I think it's important also to remember that the, for example, radio broadcasts are very important. So in the earlier part of this year, um, there were two AFRICOM airstrikes that damaged significantly Al-Shabaab radio stations. And the group itself acknowledged that this disrupted even if temporarily their, their uh, B station's ability to sort of disseminate Al-Shabaab messaging and propaganda. Um, something that we also see is, as the years go on, sort of 2009 onward, is that Al-Shabaab begins to embed media operatives, if not full media teams, in, all, in its major attacks. So it's attacks on African Union uh, forward operating bases, um, some of the big suicide um, team attacks on the hotels in Mogadishu. So this is something that that they begin to do, and then also that it's it's become very clear that they maintain a fa it seems a fairly large or robust archive of footage, which they then use in later films. So this and it doesn't seem to be at least from my point from my point of view that this is something. Uh, to give you an example, AQAP recently has been releasing a lot of sort of older footage, but it, a lot of it is, you know, it's either very poor quality, the sound is really bad, and it seems that they really don't have a lot of capacity to produce very, you know, high, um, very complex new material. So they're releasing a lot of older material that they have. This is not the case with Al Shabaab. This seems to be footage that they've kept back for whatever reason to then package. Um, you know, as part of these sort of pseudo documentary type films, sort of social media, I think with Al Shabaab is quite well known. The fact that it was it was really, it later got overshadowed by ISIS, of course, by Islamic State, and certainly Islamic State the scale of of ISIS, um, of course, is is it, you know Al Shabaab couldn't match, but Al Shabaab was one of the earliest adopted jihadi adopters of Twitter, for example. So that you know. It ran multiple Twitter accounts, you know, starting in 2011 in multiple languages. Um, it used this, uh, used the most sort of um, notably in 2013 when they attacked the Westgate Mall in Nairobi, where they had communications with the attack team inside the mall complex and they live tweeted, as Audrey mentioned, the attack. And they used it, for example, to contest Kenyan government claims that this that the attack, the siege of the mall had ended. So they they also used it to highlight and to distribute online links to the statement from their the then leader of Al Shabaab Ahmed Gudane, um, from the spokesman Ali Dara or Ali Rage. Um, so you know to highlight that and also to translations in, into English from their from the media opera, their UK media operative who does all of their English language sort of propaganda and translations. With recruitment, you know, what the, the questions that were raised, you know, about recruitment by Anwar, for example, you know, how it's often, I think, you know, there's this debate, of course, larger beyond Africa, how important is social media, new media, the internet to recruitment, and that Al-Shabaab's recruitment, particularly in the region, in the Horn of Africa, pre-exists a lot of, or, or is concurrent at least with a lot of the expansion of their online presence, for example, in 2007, that it, it, it uh, they had recruitment net networks around East Africa, at least from 2007, probably earlier when they were, a, you know, a segment of the Islamic Courts Union. So this is something that pre-existed or, or ran concurrently with their um, expansion, sort of digital expansion, media expansion. So um, it's clear that they see recruitment from abroad, from diaspora communities, from non-Somali sort of communities, as this is something that's benefited by their propaganda, by their sort of use of emerging sort of the, the increase of availability, the ease of use, the affordability of production software, of, of computers, of cell phones, things like this. So they do, it's clear that they see a value in that, but it's also important, I think, to note that it they're not reliant totally on um, this technology for recruitment. And then I'll, I'll close with just the same question um, with financing that Al Shabaab, you know, uses 
you know, primarily still uses older forms of uh, sort of uh, revenue collection, tax extortion, um, and also when it uses it uses mobile money transfers, but these are based on mobile phones often. Um, it's, it's true that they have started to use apps, sort of bank apps to transfer money from bank account to bank account, but they still use primarily sort of older established mobile money transfers, things like this, and not necessarily the most, um, sort of the newest kind of technology for financing. So, and I'll just close with that. Thank you, uh, Chris. So one, one brief follow-up question there, and I, I wanna leave some time for Q&A. So if you could keep your response relatively short, you, you mentioned briefly that you wanted to give a little bit of a sense of how concerned you are about the drone threat from, yeah. uh, from Al-Shabaab. And, and I think this is a particularly interesting question and, uh, because we learned, for example, as a result of Al-Shabaab's recent Manda Bay attack, that the group has at least acquired uh, surveillance drones. So given that I, I think this is probably the, the cheap, accessible, lethal emerging technology that we're most concerned about in Africa over the next five or 10 years as being a potentially attractive for, for extremist groups to adopt. I'd, I'd be curious as to what your take is with respect to how, what Al-Shabaab's view is on drones. Do you think this is a manageable threat? Do you think they're interested? Uh, I think it certainly is manageable. I think, I do think that they're interested. The, you mentioned the Manda Bay, their, their big propaganda film where they have, seems fairly extensive footage of the attack as it was occurring on the, the Manda Bay airfield in, in Kenya. The, um, they have over the years, uh, over sort of pre sort of before Manda Bay, highlighted the their capture or their downing and capture of um, more simple kind of surveillance drones like the Raven, for example, that the African Union uses that that, that the United States provided to the African Union mission. Um, something that's I think of concern potentially to their acquire acquiring of drones is the sort of growing and emerging commercial field of, of commercial drones um, in Kenya and neighboring countries as well as in so even the there's a emerging sort of projects in Kenya for example to develop uh, you know um, delivery drone delivery things like this that this and al-shabaab has networks in 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 Kenya and then in Somalia that Somalia rather that it's it also has um, you know it's infiltrated the ports so it, it for its taxation, we know that it has access to um, cargo manifests, so it knows what's coming in and when. And that also, finally, and I'll end with this: that it is, um, you know, that it is with its IEDs that it's shown itself capable of taking a variety of goods and sort of repurposing repurposing them for for military uses. And that I and finally, I think that it certainly has. It would have a use for drones, particularly for surveillance purposes, um, for its sort of attacks on, on, on operating bases outside of Mogadishu. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. So we will now begin to turn to the question and answer period. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of questions yet, so I encourage participants, if they have questions, now's the time. Please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to submit your written questions for the panelists. You may submit your question in any language you like. And as moderator, I will convey as many questions as my time will allow. And while we wait for questions to populate a little bit more, I actually have one brief follow-up question for, for, for all three of you. As we, we mentioned, this was going to be a focus of, of the webinar. I think you've each made in your own way a compelling case that emerging technology needs to be taken into account with respect to how African states, regional organizations, and the international community respond to the extremist threat. Mm -hmm. Um, but if there's one thing I've learned since I've been studying cyber issues in particular, it's that there is a deeply personal element to technology. And we can't really hope to ever address the ways in which technology is impacting violent extremism without also considering what the state response is doing, and how that impacts governance, how that impacts citizen security, and how that impacts human rights. So my question to you briefly is, and I think this is a really difficult question, is how can African states reconcile the need to adopt these new technologies in order to respond to the threats that, that extremist groups are and how they're using emerging technology with the need to safeguard citizen security and democracy. Um, Chris, why don't we, I should go in reverse order. Why don't we start with you, go back to Anwar and, and, and with Audrey. Sure, I'll keep it brief. I think in the Somalia context specifically that it, um, I'm gonna tie it to the sort of broader questions of the politicization of the security services and of the intelligence services, the, the sort of the ongoing political 
upheaval or, or sort of conflict between the federal government and the member states. Um, you know, there's been this question of whether the, the federal uh, intelligence services have been politicized by various parties. And I think that this, um, there's not a, uh, there needs to be a, a concentrated effort to ensure that the security services who would be using this kind of new technology for, for uh, whether it be, um, you know, CCTV, things like this, that it would be used in a, in a democratic way. I think that the safeguards need to be built up. I think so in the Somali context, I think that this is still a, a important issue and, and potentially a, a concern. Thank you very much. Uh, Anwar, over to you. Uh, sure. <clears throat> I think the challenge is, you know, how do we strike a balance between, you know, combating cyber terrorism and cyber crime for that matter, while, you know, what you said, preserving human rights and, and freedoms. Uh, so we have seen a lot of countries, you know, producing legislation to do that. Legislation is, is necessary because you need to sharpen the responses, you need to clear logistical frameworks to tackle terrorism, uh, cyber terrorism. Uh, but, but, but uh, you know, this means that cyber terrorists should also be defined with, with precision, right? We need to have a better understanding also of the roles and the responsibilities of various law enforcement uh, stakeholders. And that should be given, you know, careful uh, uh, consideration. What we have seen is that uh, in several uh, contexts in the African continent, especially in authoritarian governments, and there are quite a bit of them, that the governmental fight against, you know, uh, uh, cyber terrorism is, is substantially threatening, you know, individual freedom and, and the civil rights of local civil society. So civil surveillance technologies, uh, you know, and, and, and the fight against terrorism, you know, frequently turns into activities against individual rights. And there are several examples. Egypt, for example, is ruled by an authoritarian regime, as you know, uses this emergency law that is still in, in action, you know, that to label all forms of criticism of government as, as, as terrorism and as a threat to national security. So new technology is given to, to countries such as those, you know, is giving the regimes new capacities to impose constraints on, on actors' political uh, uh, opposition. So it's being used to tackle dissent. So again, that's the, the challenge here is how do you strike a balance between combating cyber terrorism while uh, preserving human rights? Because you can't contain and defeat terrorism without uh, respect for, for human rights and freedom. So I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks Anwar. Uh, Andre, over to you. Well, I think my fellow panelists have put the answers very well. So I have uh, only a little bit to add. I agree with both Anwar and, and Christopher. I would say that one of the things that really worries me is the tendency to overcorrect and then to import major surveillance uh, state architecture that begins to impose upon those human rights and civil liberties of uh, the people. Because one of the most important things that any government can have, and it's far more important than any technology or any weapon, is legitimacy. And legitimacy is undermined by abuse of uh, the rights of the people. And so, preserving legitimacy and also the rule of law. I, I think that, that having legal constraints and regulations against certain types of very accessible and lethal technologies is one thing, but then having a major surveillance response that overreacts and undermines the rights of the people is ultimately extremely counterproductive. So maintain legitimacy through a good balance is what I would say. No, absolutely. I think it's really important to keep in mind that even as we respond to terrorist groups, right, legitimacy is really important. I mean, that's one of the main drivers of, of, of terrorist recruitment is the perception of the government as being illegitimate. So staying legitimate is really, really important. So we have, we have um, a couple of really insightful questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask maybe three questions. We'll go through the panelists and ask for each of their insights and whatever question uh, strikes their, their interest, so they don't necessarily have to answer all three of these questions. Maybe we'll have time for one more round after this. Uh, maybe we won't. So first, we have a question. I think this is a really good one, which is that, you know, in what measure can the use of new technologies be considered a vulnerability for extremist organizations? You know, for example, 
uh, by using telephones and GPS and by having a record of their activities that can actually open up open their activities up to compromise by the state. So I think that's a really, really good point. I'm, I'm curious to hear our, our panelists' reaction to that. Um, secondly, we have a question on how African governments can work together to prevent the use of mobile finance platforms to, to, to prevent, to, to finance the activities of extremist groups. Again, a question about how, how you know, especially, I think this is especially pertinent given the, the spread of mobile money across Africa as one of the leading centers for mobile finance and that being a concern. So if any, any panelists have insight on that, we'd love to hear it. And then finally, we have a question on you know, technology transfer. And this question particularly asks if there are technology transfers by a security force assistance, but I think it's, it's a legitimate question to ask, you know, to what extent, you know, how exactly are extremist groups across Africa acquiring these emerging technologies? Are they buying them on the black market? Are they acquiring them from state forces? I think that's a, that's a good question to, to consider. And also an important, I think, element in their calculus as both Christopher and, and Anwar have highlighted. So let's do this in an order we haven't done yet. Let's start with Anwar this time and maybe go then to Audrey and then to, the, to Chris. So Anwar, what, take any of these three questions. What's your, what's your opinion? What's your perspective? Um, <clears throat> sure. I mean, what can, you know, how can governments work to, together to, to uh, tackle this, this problem of cyber terrorism and money, you know, mobile money platforms? Uh, well, well, one of it is that we have seen, you know, countries in, in the continent, uh, you know, take a numerous step to, to adopt first their national legal and regulatory frameworks accordingly. Uh, so the, the Tunisians, uh, I'm speaking North Africa, which, which I know the Sahel better, uh, even the Egyptian government, you know, has established the High Council for Cybersecurity, uh, Moroccan government has launched uh, uh, also its, its, its own uh, council for uh, for uh, for for cyber security. Uh, that that's one. Second is is the role of the since this is obviously a transnational issue, uh, continental issue is the role of the African Union and and the Rex can 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 play here. And and so far the only documents that we have at the EU level that deals with cyber issues, including you know the issue of uh, <clears throat> of. Uh, financing is the conventional cybersecurity and personal data protection. The problem we have is that only, I think, I think 14 of the 54, you know, African countries have signed and, and only seven or eight have ratified, you know, this convention. So this shows you that the political will is still to implement the provision listed in this convention is still not there. Uh, and it's further uh, uh, furthermore, it means that the convention is not yet in force because it requires ratification by, I think, if I'm not mistaken, at least 15, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, member states. So the document has a framework to tackle, you know, uh, uh, issues for member states, but it all I think it can do is to guide them toward, you know, member states to establish their own cybersecurity, their own data protection laws, their own financial protection uh, uh, laws, but it, ultimately it's up to the member states to interpret the convention to implement their own laws at the national uh, uh, level here. So, so that's one, I think, one one way to uh, two ways to do it at the, the member state level and also at the uh, at the African uh, state uh, state level. So I think I'm I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and let my fellow panelists talk about the question. Andre, over to you. Right. Well, so um, Anwar has addressed question two. I'll say something briefly about questions one and three, and then I'm sure there's a lot more that Chris will have to uh, Christopher will have to add. Um, but before I get started, I want to add one thing about my presentation and about this panel generally that I'd like to make clear, which is that terrorists, small groups, individuals, they're going to continue to use the old technologies. It's not that they're going to stop using guns and bombs, say. I mean, that's the old phrase, terrorists will always use guns and bombs. They're not gonna stop using vehicle attacks, IEDs, knife attacks, and so on. Nothing that I am talking about with respect to innovation leaves out the old. It's a matter of how do you integrate the new into using the old? And here's where 
I think we do have um, quadcopters and the potential for 3D printing and all the things that I mentioned. But to get to the question, new technologies do have good countermeasures, some of them. So particularly when it comes to tracking cell phones, for example, there are um, good countermeasures. And you know the key thing to do there is to educate the force, the government force, to use granular responses that are within the rule of law, not a major, again, not a major surveillance system that crushes the innovation of the people. But um, it, it is possible if you understand the technologies well enough to have a great many different countermeasures. So um, that would be another talk in itself, but it is an important question and something to, per to pursue. And then as for the third question, technology transfer, um, historically, most of the technologies that uh, non-state groups have used are either stolen or um, repurposed from former military forces that uh, you know, leave those technologies around or who demonstrate how they're used. So this is a very serious question. And it's one of the reasons why I think we can't ignore the, uh, the threat of new technologies because they're increasingly being integrated into regular military forces. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. Uh, Chris, over to you. I think we might have room for one round. So Chris, go ahead. Sure, yeah. So uh, just very briefly on, on sort of all three questions. First, um, yes, definitely there is a downside to these groups. Um, one, I saw that one of the recommended readings by Professor Menkaus, um, you know, is a very, addresses this with Shabab. Um, very specifically, you know, it, it left Shabab open to now that everyone has a phone and access to the internet and that internal dissidents, defectors were able to then broadcast their views. Sort of most famously, there was an American foreign fighter, Omar Hamami, who was killed by Shabab in 2013. He used this very well. Well, YouTube, I mean, uh, you know, posted his own videos, audio. Um, ISIS defectors who were former members of Shabab did this in 2014, 2015. So it does, and Al Shabab was also well aware of and has been for some time of the ability to track cell phones. So they they have um, fairly strict uh, restrictions on their members using their cell phones because they know that they, these can be tracked. Um, so so in the case of Shabab they're very aware of these weaknesses. And for some of them though, like the uh, increased access to the internet and sort of counter messaging by other militants, frankly, that you know they don't really have a clear um, countermeasure. For mobile transfers, some, one of the problems, I think it ties into sort of larger problems of or issues of corruption, of the ability of groups like Al-Shabaab to infiltrate sort of even local or even the federal government. So there are, and there have been improvements in requirement for IDs to open bank accounts, for example, and the international community has been um, working with the federal governments of Somalia to implement these. However, the, the fact that 77 or so percent of Somalis generally don't have clear government identity documents is, is an issue and that Al-Shabaab has been able to procure um, fraudulent or, or sort of bogus uh, ID documents to open accounts, to open bank accounts. And, and these accounts have only been sort of revealed because of very strange large cash transfers and transactions, deposits, things like this. And then the question of the transfer of technology, um, uh, like Audrey mentioned just now, the, the acquirement capture of this technology, and, and in a case like Somalia, where there are so many, so many rather international actors present, Turkey, uh, in the past, the UAE, of course, the United States, you know, the, the Turkey has introduced drones uh, reportedly to, it has a very large military and training presence in Somalia. The African Union has at least the, the sort of the, the, the Raven surveillance drone, and that most of Al-Shabaab's early sort of explosives were captured from from, from African Union forces, so that it, it's demonstrated this capacity to both temporarily overrun certain African Union or government bases and then acquire weapons, explosives, arms, and other equipment. So this is, I think, a you know, regulating perhaps or controlling you know, how these uh, drones, for example, drone assets are deployed, I think is important because of this sort of demonstrated history of, of, of Shabab to, to do this. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think the title of that Mankaus article you mentioned is the double-edged sword. And I think that's a really great metaphor for how technology potentially impacts extremist groups. Um, but also that, that I think that also applies to state actors in their response as well. And that's that's kind of always the, the key with new technology is, is, is taken into account when you're, when you're responding to non-state threats, but in a way that is consistent with the governance structure and, and citizen security and, and human rights. Um, we have one final, I think, important series of questions I'd actually like to get Audrey's take on before we conclude. And I, I think it's kind of fundamental of some of the themes in her book, actually. And the question is, can digital technology 
uh, change the global balance of power. And I, I, would, I would add to that is, can digital technology change the balance of power between state and non-state actors? Because I think that's kind of a core theme running through, through your book. And I think that's been a core theme running through this discussion. So uh, what's, what's your take on that? That is a very big, big question. And I think it is one that we are grappling with right now in democracies, because you have these two big models of what the future will look like. You've got uh, you know, authoritarian surveillance suites and very strong control of populations, um, which I referred to earlier. And then you've got this potential, for, on the other hand, for uh, disorder, increasingly lethal use of force by non-state actors, increasingly leveraged use of force. So between these two things, there are initiatives right now that um, I'm very optimistic about with respect to building a governance model for democracies going forward that does not shift the balance of power, that keeps the balance of power in the hands of the people and in governance that represents those people as democracies should. But there's no denying the fact that our new technologies have proven to be a challenge. And finding that middle road between the two is the most important question, I think, going forward in terms of, of uh, democratic governance for all of us to consider. Thank you, perfect timing, great answer. And with that, allow me on behalf of the Africa Center and all of our alumni to thank our excellent panelists for I think really illustrating the depth of the relationship between emerging technology and violent extremism and, and offering their thoughts on how to best confront this threat. Uh, so takeaway time. Um, for me, one key takeaway is for us to adopt a much broader view for how we understand the relationship between emerging technology and violent extremism for Africa. Um, you know, I, I think Audrey makes a pretty compelling case that we're living through an open technological revolution in which a wide range of technologies are influencing the ability of non-state armed groups to mobilize, to project power, and to commit violence, as she summed up in her remarks. Remarks, And this means that the, the scope of the threat is really much broader than, say, just the influence that the internet is having on violent extremist recruitment, which is an important aspect, but just one aspect of the problem. Or, for example, how likely a violent extremist group is to develop sophisticated cyber capabilities, which is like, a, I think, a, a fascination of cyber expert that is also just one element to the problem. You know, nevertheless, I also think we need to uh, not overhype the threat, as we've heard from both Chris and, Chris and, and Anwar. We can't frame every new technology as revolutionary. We need to understand that, that also extremist groups rely on very old technologies to achieve their political objectives. And that rarely is a technological change so radical that it completely and rapidly transforms the character and the scope of the threat from non-state actors or for any, any kind of actor for that matter. Instead, uh, the changes wrought by technology on violent extremist practices tend to be incremental and there are, there are times when the role of technology plays more influential than others. Um, you know, I think we're living through a period like that, but there are always challenges posed by emerging technology. You know, finally, just because we are living through a period in which we are, I think as Audrey mentioned earlier, hyping the, the, the role of emerging technology in all kinds of threats, that doesn't mean we need to let the cure be worse than the disease. Certainly technology has important consequences for how violent extremist groups organize, finance themselves, recruit and fight. But how authorities choose to respond also has crucial consequences for how the state is structured, for how it is governed. And I think most crucially, how it is viewed by citizens, which then decide whether or not they want to continue to support the state or support radical alternatives. And as our panelists have highlighted, responding to the threat of violent extremism with surveillance and repression, I think is not a long-term recipe for stability or success. Um, I think the recent declines in democracy and the accompanying increases in violent conflict across the African continent, something that I think the Africa Center has done very good work on, can certainly attest to this. And so with those three thoughts in mind, it's, it's unfortunately time to conclude our webinar. And allow me once again to join you all in thanking our wonderful panelists, Audrey, Christopher, and Anwar for an excellent uh, discussion. And I'd also like to encourage our audience to get in touch if they have any reactions they'd like to share 
or insights on cyber related issues. We always love to hear about our impact and this is a relatively new program. Regardless, uh, please join us for the next webinar in the series on the cyber dimensions of organized crime in Africa, which we have on the calendar for July. Thank you very much.